Thank you. We're going to come to the time in our service now. We'll look at a passage from the Bible, talk about what it means, why it matters, and what we should do about it. So if you've got a Bible with you, would you open it up to Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 21. Follow along with me. Uh, If you're using this Brown Pew Bible, it's on page 710, 710. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 21. And when you found that, would you stand together with me? I'll read this passage for us. Let's stand just in honor and appreciation of God's word. Mark writes this, verse 21. He, that is Jesus, said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And consider carefully what you hear. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given even more, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us once more and just ask God's blessing on this time as we come to his word now. Spirit of God, I'm asking you to come now and be present with us as we look to your word We're asking you to work powerfully in our hearts to open up our ears to hear and to understand what you want to say to us this morning. God, I'm trusting that you have drawn each person here this morning for a specific purpose that you want to accomplish. You've accomplished a purpose in me this week as I've studied this passage. Now I'm asking that you would accomplish that purpose in each one of us this morning as we listen. You tell us clearly in your word, when you send it out, it doesn't return to you a void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you send it. Father, would you accomplish that purpose in each one of us this morning? And as I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. I uh, talked a few weeks ago about a strange phenomenon. That happens particularly for those of us uh, when you are a parent with young kids, namely coming to encounter all kinds of things, media, movies, books, things I, that you would normally not encounter on your own. Uh, back then, I mentioned the example of knowing the names and stories of every single Disney princess, uh, uh, not a, a pursuit that I would have had on my own. Another example of that would be the books, watching endless DVD episodes of The Magic School Bus. Who knows about the magic school bus? Raise your hand if you read or saw this growing up. Once again, not something I would have chosen on my own, right? My wife was sitting down some night to watch Netflix and trying to decide what to watch. It wouldn't have been like, you know, should we watch a documentary? Maybe a drama, maybe a rom-com? No. I, and I wouldn't have said, oh, no, no, what's this magic school bus? Let's check. That, that sounds interesting to me. would not have chosen these shows to interact with, and yet I've seen, I think, all of them. I've seen every single one. If you read these books or, or, or seen the shows, you know that the main idea is it follows the adventures of this elementary school teacher, Mrs. Frizzle, and her elementary school class as they go on this school bus to learn about all these different things, discover the wonders of science uh, in all these amazing ways. In this school bus, though, that can transform into everything from an airplane to a submarine to anything. And in some of the episodes, in particular, 
The, the, the school bus and the whole class can shrink down to microscopic size. It's magic, you see. It can shrink down to microscopic size and even go underneath the surface of the skin into the bloodstream so that the kids can learn about things like the circulatory system, learn about heart health and cholesterol and all these things. It's, it's incredible. And when you think about it, that's actually a really amazing way to learn. It's an amazing way when you actually can go beneath the surface Seeing and making surprising discoveries when you're able to see things that just looking at something from the outside, you wouldn't be able to see. You wouldn't be able to know and understand. Well, we're continuing in this series we began a number of weeks ago through the parables of Jesus called Stories of the Kingdom, looking at some of the more well-known parables that Jesus told in his earthly ministry, teaching us about what the kingdom of God is like, teaching us about what kinds of things are valued there, as well as what kinds of things are despised there. In the parable that we looked at last Sunday, the parable of the sower, it immediately precedes this passage that we read this morning. And Jesus taught there that what was valued in God's kingdom, we said, was both a freedom in the sowing of the seed, anywhere and everywhere we can, as well as receiving the seed deeply into an open heart. Those are the things that are valued in the kingdom of God. And as Jesus continues his teaching in our passage this morning, now with a series of smaller parables, where Jesus is going to take his disciples now on his own kind of magic school bus ride. Maybe it's Jesus, so we'll call it the divine school bus. He takes them on the divine school bus on a ride beneath the surface of the soil once the seed has been planted there. He takes us down underneath to show us what growth in the kingdom of God looks like once that seed's been planted as well as what that growth is trying to produce, which is actually incredible helpful, incredibly helpful for us because just like Miss Frizzle's students in that class, here too, we're enabled to make some dis- surprising discoveries when we're able to see beneath the surface, see what's going on underneath the surface of that soil once the seed's been planted, things we wouldn't otherwise be able to see just by looking at it from the outside. And I think what we'll see today in our passage as we look at what Jesus reveals here, we're going to see that these next things that are valued in his kingdom are patience, as well as trust in God's timing to bring about the growth that he desires. In order to do that, I want to look at our passage this morning in three ways. I want to show you the blessing of sowing, and then we'll talk about the process of growth and the product of growth. All right, those three things. The blessing of sowing and the process and the product of growth. So if you've closed your Bibles, would you open them again? Mark 4, beginning at verse 21. Follow along with me now as we look at a few different stories of the kingdom all bound up together here. So let's look first of all at the blessing of sowing. The blessing of sowing. So in verse 21 and 25, just before Jesus takes us underneath the surface of the soil to watch this kingdom growth, he continues his teaching from the previous parable that we looked at last Sunday about sowing the seed of the gospel. He continues to teach us, sow the seed freely in every place we can, and now promising blessing for all who do that. Look at me, first of all, at verse 21. Jesus says this, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it up on a stand? Now, It's a little bit difficult to understand exactly what Jesus is getting at there. If you're like me, it seems on the surface like Jesus has left talking about sowing and he's moving on to something else. But there's good reason to believe that that's not the case. First of all, when you consider the context of what Jesus just said there. Remember what we saw last Sunday, that the parable of the sower, Jesus is talking almost entirely about growth of the seed once it's been planted. That's what he spent all this time talking about. And then the two parables that follow this are all about the growth of the implanted seed. It's just a continual talking about this. So it's, it's a way that gives us an indication that very likely Jesus is still talking about sowing the seed of the gospel even here. Second reason for that is that although it's hard to see here in the New International Version, if you're using this version of the Bible, we don't, what we don't see is that in the original Greek, technically, Jesus doesn't say, do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl, and so forth. What he actually says is this. Listen, does the lamp come in order that you would place it under a bowl or under a bed? That's that's a little bit different, isn't it? You can see that they made a translator's choice to say, do you bring in a lamp? But here what we see, it's subtle, but clearly Jesus is speaking of both the lamp and the people who place it 
as the active agents. It's both. You include Jesus' teaching in John 9 about when he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And all of a sudden we see very quickly, Jesus hasn't stopped talking about sowing the message of the gospel at all. He's just changed the metaphor temporarily. Instead of talking about sowing seeds, now he's talking, he's saying, raise me up. Put me up on such a high place in your life, in your church, that the light of the gospel is clearly seen to as many people as possible. It's the same idea, just, just pre- spread it out as broadly as it can be, whether it's sowing seed or shining light. Do it as broadly and so as many people can see it as possible. That's the implication. It's still the same in both. Because you see in verse 22, look with me there, Jesus says, basically do that because the whole purpose of my coming is, is that. It's to disclose, it's to reveal the secrets of the kingdom that are presently hidden from the world's eyes, which, is, of course, that's exactly what light does in darkness. It reveals things. So we see Jesus goes on to say, For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. So Jesus is saying here, continue this. Continue to spread the message about me everywhere you go, everywhere you, every chance you get, and continue to set me in such a high place in your own life that the message will continue to transform you as well. And look at the blessings that he promises if we'll be obedient to what he says here in verse 24 and 25. Listen, he says, Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now, in our modern day setting, even today, we still use, you've likely heard, and maybe even used yourself, this phrase, You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Have you said this before? This is what my older brother used to say when I would be annoying him and he would punch me or hurt me in some way. Be like, listen, reap what you sow, bro. He would say this to me. This is the same thing here. The origin of that phrase actually comes out of Galatians chapter 6, where Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he will also reap. That's, That's where that comes from. Now, a little bit earlier, in 2 Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul writes this. Listen, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now, yes, Paul is talking in that context about a financial offering. But according to Jesus here in Mark 4, the principle spills over it, carries over directly into our sowing of the gospel seed, as well as the cultivation of that gospel seed in our own lives. I see at least two applications to this in our own lives today. First of all, as it relates to our sowing of the gospel seed. Jesus is saying to this, he's saying to us individually as well as corporately as a church family, he's saying, do you really want to see a gospel movement take place? Do you really want to see this great gospel movement take place in your marriage, in your families, in our city, in our world? Do you really want to see that happen? then he's saying continue to sow the seed of the gospel as broadly, as as wastefully as you can in every place you can. Again, as we said last week, not prejudging whether or not you think the soil will receive it or not, just sowing every place you can. And we need to ask that question because we might say, yeah, I want to see this great gospel movement in our city and world, and that's what I want. And yet still, the reality is we're still sowing the message as sparingly, as ungenerously as possible, even though Jesus clearly says here, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Think of this like sunscreen. If you're, sunscreen's expensive, right? If you're trying to sparingly put it on, you're going to have very limited benefit as to how much sun protection you actually get. Same thing with sowing the seed. You want to see a great gospel movement in your city, in our family, in our world, so greatly, so generously. And you'll see it. As it relates to cultivating the seed in our own lives, Jesus says, again, individually and as a church family, how are you continuing to sow the gospel seed and to cultivate the soil of your own heart? This is such an important question for us to ask ourselves if we claim to be followers of Jesus because as pastor and author J.D. Greer says so well in his 
book simply titled Gospel. The gospel is not simply the diving board into which we jump into the pool of Christianity. The gospel is the diving board and the pool in which we swim. It's both. And he goes on, that's why growth in Christ is never going beyond the gospel. It's going down deeper into the gospel. We need to know that. The gospel isn't for people who've never heard about Jesus only. It's for us. We need to continue to grow deeper. You never move beyond the message. And Jesus' promise here is with whatever measure you use, it will be measured to you. So, okay, so how wastefully, how generously are you continuing to sow the seed in your own life? The measure you use, it will be measured to you. Continue to sow wastefully, deeply in your own life. We always need to hear that message again and again because we're forgetful and because there's no depth to how deep we can go. So continue to sow even in your own life. Okay, so that's the blessings of sowing. As you can see, the blessings are available both for those who the seed is planted in as well as those doing the planting. Now we can begin to follow Jesus underneath the surface of the soil as he shows us what the process of growth looks like as well as what the product of growth looks like in his kingdom. So let's look first of all at the process of growth. Process of growth. Now in verse 26, when Jesus begins his teaching, he's still up on the surface. We can see he says, uh, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. So we're still up above the earth here. But very quickly, right away, verse 27 through 29, he, he takes us down underneath now. We're going down in the divine school bus underneath the surface of the soil uh, to see what growth looks like once this seed has been planted in the good soil that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower. And we know it's the good soil because Jesus said the seed produces fruit. And as Jesus shows us this process of growth underneath the surface, as we get this kind of amazing view underneath the surface now, I see at least three things that we're going to look at quickly about what growth looks like in the kingdom of God. I want to look at them quickly just to help us both grow our faith in the process as well as to understand more deeply how it works. Here's the first one. Seed growth in the kingdom of God happens independently. It happens independently independently, and by that I mean independently of us. We see this in verse 27 and beginning of verse 28. Look with me there. Jesus says this, Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, this is the farmer who sowed, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain. Okay, so theologian David Garland explains, he says that the farmer has no idea how growth happens implies he is not the cause of the growth and is ignorant of the process. The seed holds within itself the secret of its growth. And this is exactly in line with what we said last week about the incredible power contained inside the seed of the gospel to produce growth, completely independent of us. Again, Paul's words, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it. The gospel itself, independently of us, is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It's the message that has the power to transform, which which ought to be incredibly freeing and empowering to us when we think about going out to sow the seed or when we think about cultivating the soil of our own hearts to receive it more deeply because the teaching of Paul as well as Jesus' teaching here is this. What you've been called to is sowing. You've been called to sowing, to being witnesses for Jesus. You've not been called to transform people's hearts. That's not what you're called to. The transformation, that's the gospel's job. Why? Because only the gospel has the power to actually accomplish it. Next thing we see is that seed growth in the kingdom of God happens imperceptibly. It happens imperceptibly. You see this again in verse 27, particularly in the first half. Again, Jesus says, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. So, night and day, all the time, and again, completely independently of anything the sower does, Jesus says this growth is ongoing underneath the surface of the soil once it's planted. We may not be able to see it, but it's happening. It's continuing to go on, which should also be really freeing to us, particularly when we think about 
growth and how that takes place. We can see that growth is taking place. Roots are going down, even though it might not yet be visible to us. That's something many of us need to hear. There's lots of different places. Uh, if you've heard of friends who have gone to the mission field, for instance, and they're, they're saying, I don't understand. I've been here for a year. I've been faithfully serving. There doesn't seem to be anything happened. Maybe, maybe the gospel is not powerful to change. Maybe my, my sowing is, is useless. And, and the message here of encouragement is, no, no, you don't, you don't know what's going on underneath the surface. You can't see what growth is happening yet. This could be encouraging. There's lots of different places this could happen. Maybe if you're a parent and you have a child and you know you've sowed the seed of the gospel in them, but right now it seems like they're not walking with Jesus. Maybe they don't want anything to do with him. You can still hold out hope. You can still hold out hope. Why? Because growth may still be going on underneath the surface and you just can't see it right now. The sprout has not yet pushed through the hard soil at the top. And honestly... Talk to us anytime. My wife and I are classic examples of this. Because the seed was planted in us at a young age in what seemed like good soil, and yet for years in our young adult years, it looked like the soil of our hearts was as hard as cement. And I know it's a complicated question. It's hard to understand. Okay, well, when, when did the seed actually go deeply to when it actually brought about salvation? Great question. We don't know, and yet the whole time we, we, we knew that gospel message. We knew it even though it didn't seem to be producing any fruit in us. And what Jesus is saying here is that growth could still be going on underneath the surface right now. It could still be putting down roots and pushing up towards the surface, and you just can't see it. And the message and the hope is just so keep sowing. Keep cultivating. Don't give up. Not everyone is going to have a conversion story like Paul's, where it's just like, bam, meet Jesus. Oh, I hated him, now I love him. It's not always going to be like that. And honestly, when we looked at Paul, you've seen, and there's good evidence of the fact that the seed was planted and the soil was being worked up long before that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. So we can't see what's going on. That sprout may be ready to push through that hard soil. So continue to sow. Continue to be faithful to sow. Last thing we see here is that seed growth in the kingdom of God happens as God intends. It happens as he intends it to happen. We see that in verses 28 and 29. Look there. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. You notice he doesn't say, okay, first the head grows, then the stalk. There's an, there's an order to it, right? There's an order to how God brings about growth through the power of the gospel from this, the very first a process of germination all the way to, to fruit growing and harvesting. So what that means is just because you might see a little bit of shoot pushing up from the ground doesn't mean, hey, I'm going to go grab my sickle and start slashing away, bringing a harvest. I'm going to go grab my you-pick baskets from the garage and start looking for fruit. Maybe not. There's a, a process to how the growth happens, and this is particularly important for us to hear. If you've been sowing in the life of someone, you've been trying to disciple them, and it seems like they've got an openness to receive the message. They're open, and it seems like they've received it. We're like, great, and we can rush ahead of God's process of growth, start giving them a big list of all these things. Oh, you should be now. Oh, and don't forget to overwhelming the person when they're just, just a tiny shoot of growth. And what can happen is we can end up trying to impose our own plan, our own process of growth on top of or in place of God's. It doesn't work like that. Or as I've come to see in my own life countless times, listen, it's not wrong to, to desire and to have hopes and dreams for spiritual growth and maturity in someone that you're discipling. That's not wrong at all. I, I have that absolutely for my own family. I have hopes and, and desires for their growth, and yet this is also true. You're always going to have to deal with people where they are, not where you'd hope that they could be. We'll always and only be able to deal with people where they are right now, not where you'd like them to be. And you need to know that. So, because you can trust then in the power of God and the gospel to transform, have patience with his timing to bring about the growth, the growth that you know he wants to bring. God desires growth much more than you do, believe me. And we can trust Paul's words in Philippians 1, 6, we can be confident, we can rest and put all our hope in the fact that he who began a good work will carry it out to completion. 
The verse doesn't say, he who began a good work is waiting on you so that he can bring it to completion. He will bring it to completion. It says a little bit later uh, in chapter 2, God is the one who works in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. He's working. 1 Corinthians 7, neither he who plants or waters is anything but God who brings the growth. In the same way that our human efforts are incapable of initiating the transformation process, so apart from the working of God, they're incapable of speeding it up either. Pray for it. Seek to cultivate the soil. But no, only God's going to bring about that growth. And he's going to bring about it perfectly in his good time. So we've seen the blessing of sowing, the process of growth, what that looks like in the kingdom once the seed has been sown. The last thing we'll look at together quickly now is the product of growth. The product of growth. We need to look at this because just as we saw the process of growth isn't exactly what we'd expect in God's kingdom, so too that growth also doesn't produce what we expect it to be able to produce either. When I was a younger kid, I remember going to the dentist, having to get some of my teeth pulled. I had some overcrowding stuff going on. And, and after the dentist, he'd done, you know, x-rays and the cleaning and the freezing. Uh, I don't know what I expected the next thing to come off that little silver tray was when he was actually going to extract the teeth. But when he pulled off, honestly, this pretty tiny pair of pliers, that was not what I was expecting. It looked like, really? And I remember... When he did that, he took the pliers off. I looked at the pliers, I looked at him, and I looked at the pliers again, and I was like, you sure that's going to be enough to do the job? <laughs> Thankfully, he just smiled, proceeded with what he knew would be more than enough, easily <laughs> removed those two teeth with what felt like a flick of the wrist, just boom, out. If you look at the circumstances that Jesus lays out now in this next parable, verses 30 to 32, there's no question what is able to be produced by a tiny mustard seed is also far greater than what you'd expect it to be able to produce just by looking at it. Let's just quickly refresh our minds here of this parable, starting in verse 30 again. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? What parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seed you plant in the ground, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. Uh, people who know about this kind of stuff say these, these mustard seed trees can grow up to 12 feet in height, even though it's coming from this tiny little seed. Now, first of all, some of you, I know we've got some super gardeners here. Again, we talked about this last week. We've got some super gardeners in here who would know, uh, just a second, the mustard seed, that's not the smallest of all seeds. That's not. Actually, the, the tropical orchid apparently is the smallest seed. So, I mean, Jesus is God. Sh shouldn't, he, shouldn't he know that stuff? Okay. Yeah, he does. And, and the quick answer to that is just we need to understand uh, who the audience is Jesus is speaking to. Who is the audience he's speaking to? He's speaking to a largely agrarian society, the ancient Near East, using a metaphor, a farming metaphor, that they would have easily understand as broadly because this is something they would have planted there. Again, if you see, he says, this is the smallest of seeds you plant. He doesn't say it's the smallest seed in the world. It's the smallest of seeds you plant. Secondly, David Garland, again, points up, the smallest of the seed was proverbial. And Jesus is not necessarily... Comparing the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, to the size of it, but to what happens to a mustard seed. And just as that God's process of growth transforms a tiny speck of a mustard seed into a six to ten foot high shrub, what God will accomplish through the death and resurrection of Jesus will be just as extraordinary. Theologian James Edwards says it this way, The greater point of this parable of the mustard seed is that the kingdom of God arises from obscurity and insignificance. That's how it works. And I think that's truly the key to unlocking what Jesus is getting at here in this second parable about the kingdom of God. He's saying, don't be fooled by appearances. You've got to go down beneath the surface to understand what's going on here because not only is the way things that are produced in my kingdom, different than what you'd expect. So what is able to be produced by this small, seemingly insignificant beginning, far greater and far different than what you'd expect as well. 
That's significant even in itself because maybe you already know in Jesus' day you had all kinds of people who were expecting a very different kind of kingdom when the Messiah came. When God's promised rescuer came, they were expecting this powerful warrior king who was going to come in, clean up, get rid of the Romans, restore political and military power to the nation of Israel. They were not expecting a baby born into poverty to an unwed mother. Okay? They, they were not expecting uh, someone who would be offensive to the religious leaders of the day or, or who would put on clothes like a servant and wash his disciples' feet. And they were definitely not expecting a Messiah who was going to be beaten, crucified, and put in a tomb. I'm not suggesting for a second that there wasn't a lot of Old Testament evidence that should have told them that that's what they should have expected. I'm just saying that they didn't. They didn't expect it, which is evidenced even in the fact that after Jesus rises from the dead, he comes, appears to his disciples, proving, I am who I said I was. I'm the Son of God. Even then, those closest to Jesus are still like, okay, so is it, is it now? Now are you going to restore the nation of Israel to us? They, 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 they just couldn't see it. They couldn't grasp what his kingdom was truly about. Why? Well, because, first of all, they were mistaken about the kind of kingdom Jesus had come to bring. But more than that, I think they couldn't grasp how someone like Jesus, just this one guy, could bring about any kind of kingdom. They see a man standing there, and honestly, they're asking the same question. You sure this is going to be enough to do the job? How? How? And so to answer their question, Jesus says, guys, look at a mustard seed. Look at this. It's the smallest of seed you know how to plant, and yet look how huge a tree that seed is able to grow and produce uh, something so large that the birds of the air can find shelter in its branches. You see that? That's what the kingdom of God is like as well. Yes, it starts out tiny and insignificant, like a single rabbi and his 12 uneducated followers. It starts out like that. Yes, it starts out looking backward and upside down, like humbling yourself in order to become great, like losing your life in order to find it. Yes, it starts out looking like failure and loss. And guys, listen, you don't even have any idea how much that's going to play out in a couple of weeks here. Yes, it starts out looking like that, and yet still as impossible as it might look to you right now, quietly, imperceptibly, independently, I am growing the grandest of trees. I am growing exactly the kingdom the Father intends to build, and it's going to be so large. It's going to be so vast that the birds of the air, by which he means all the nations of the world, will be able to find shelter in its branches. That's what my kingdom is like. And the question we need to ask ourselves this morning, now here, 2018, is this. Do I truly believe that Jesus can and still is growing that kingdom today? That he's more than enough to do the job? Do I believe that? Do I trust that his kingdom that was planted in weakness and obscurity 2,000 years ago is still growing? is still being built today in a way that can actually make a difference, can actually matter to this city and to our world? Do I trust that this simple gospel seed of faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins can actually transform a life, can actually transform the lives of the people that we live around, that we know and that we witness to every day, and that it can continue to transform me as well? Do I truly believe that? We're in church right now. We can be honest with each other, right? I hope so. Sometimes we feel like we don't know. We're not sure. Particularly when we look around us, we see all the problems still going on in our world, the greatness of them. We look around our city and see the affluence, the self-sufficiency in a city like Vancouver, and we compare that to the size of our Sunday morning gathering, and we think, How? How's that going to be enough? How could God grow his kingdom in a city like Vancouver with a small gathering like us? How could he do it? Or maybe you even look at your own life, the places where you're trying to sow right now, and you're like, how could God use me? I don't, I don't, I don't know a bunch of stuff about the Bible. 
What if I don't know all the answers to the question? Oh, look at all the ways people see that I'm not a perfect Christian. I've got all these past failings. In my, how can God use me to grow his kingdom at all? How's he going to be able to do it? And we can begin to slow down. We can begin to stop pressing in and moving forward. We can doubt that the seed, that sowing the seed is even worth it anymore. And in response to those very real doubts and questions, Jesus says, look at the mustard seed. Look at it. Consider how great a tree can grow out of something so seemingly small and insignificant. And if I can do that with a tiny little seed, just imagine what I can do with you. Imagine what I can do with this church. In fact, look at my word. Study my word. That's always the way my kingdom has grown from the beginning. There is no story in this book that's not about that. God taking weak, small, insignificant things and growing his kingdom through it. Second Corinthians, Paul says, we have this treasure that is the implanted seed of the word in jars of clay. Weak, insignificant. Why? To show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. First Corinthians, God shows the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly of this world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the, king, the things that are. What's my kingdom like? Asked Jesus, like a mustard seed. The smallest of seeds you plant so small, maybe you wonder if it's even worth planting. And yeah, do you know what? If the seed stays in your hand, if it stays in your seed pouch, whatever it is, yeah, it's powerless to grow anything, but when planted. You see that? Verse 32, yet when planted, it grows to become the largest of all garden plants. Plant the seed, Jesus says. Plant the seed and just watch what I can grow. And do, you know the reason we, do you know the reason we can trust that? Do you know the reason we can put our hope in that is for the simple reason that the one telling us about the kingdom here, the one taking us underneath the surface of the soil to see what growth looks like, he's the king. He's the one showing us. Just think of that. Every time Jesus says the kingdom of God is like, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's the supreme authority on the subject. Why? Because he's the king of that kingdom. He's the king who is bringing that kingdom to bear on this earth. And the incredible news of our passage today and of the passage we looked at last Sunday is that one of God's primary ways of bringing that kingdom to bear on this earth is us. It's, our, it's, it's the church. It's you and me. That's one of his primary ways of growing his kingdom and bringing it to bear on this earth. And yes, yes, the growth may be imperceptible at times. Yes, we may be nothing but a mustard seed compared to the size of the task. And yet that's one of the reasons I love that passage, Zechariah 4.10, so much. God says, do not despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord delights to see the work begin. Why? Because when we're willing to say, okay, God, all right, step out in faith and plant that seed that's when his power goes into action, when the seed is planted. And the good news we have again from this passage today, remember, the growth is not up to you. Transformation is not up to you. He's just calling us to sow. He's calling you to sow, to shine his light in every place and everywhere he calls us to sow and to sow with the measure with which we would want it sowed to us. How great do you want to see the kingdom grow? Sow that way. Sow like that's how big you want to see the kingdom grow. My prayer for each one of us today, as the church family that meets here at Dunbar Heights, is this, is that God would renew in us a vision for what the kingdom growing would look like. What would the kingdom look like if it grew in your family, in this church, in this community, in your neighborhoods, in our city, in our world? Can you see it? Do you have a vision for what that would look like if God's kingdom broke in and transformed that place? 
And that out of that vision, we would have a renewed passion and desire to sow his gospel and to shine his light, trusting he has more than enough power to bring the growth about. And that by that power, he is now, today, and for all time, growing a kingdom under which all the nations of the world can find shelter and rest. Oh, bring your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Let's pray.